Okay, Jeff Kazim, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Good, mo good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much for joining uh, the Hawk4.org and Element 14's presentation of Hawk Talks. This is a webinar series hoping to assist you in um, designing your Hawk Board Day solutions. Today's course is going to be a mixture of two pieces of content. Initially, Jeff Cobb will be presenting content, specifically introducing the OMAP L1338 and the AM1808 from Texas Instruments, and specifically outlining the architecture for those two processors. And then Kazim Syed, also with Texas Instruments, We'll be talking about and reviewing with you specific couple tools that are on the hawkboard.org website and how you can um, specifically work through embedded Linux porting on the hawkboard itself. Jeff, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, my name is Jeff Cobb. I'm the Applications Engineer at Texas Instruments, and um, I'm working on the uh, OMAP L1X uh, devices, which are found on the hawkboard. Uh, today, like Lori said, I'll be giving an overview of the uh, processors on the uh, OMAP L138 as well as the peripherals and different subsystems on there. So uh, first we'll talk about the uh, ARM and DSP found on the 138. Uh, next we'll move on to a review of the TRU subsystem, which is new on these devices. Um, then we'll go briefly over all the peripherals on the device. There's a lot of them and we don't have that much time, so we'll go kind of quickly through that and, and the highlights of each of those. Uh, we'll talk about what boot modes are supported, uh, some of the power management and Pinbox configuration, and finally the development tools that are available. So this is an overall block diagram of the OMAP L138. So um, it has both an ARM9 and a uh, C674X DSP core. Um, so both of them are running at 450 megahertz, and uh, some of the benefits of these on the left you'll see um, the first is these are very low power devices, so we target uh, so, sort of the mobile space. And we're talking about for standby about 12 milliwatts of power and 450 milliwatts for active power. Um, some of the things we'll talk about that these devices feature would be dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. So um, if you're not needing a lot of horsepower, you can scale back the, the frequency and voltage when you need to. Uh, both of these have large on-chip memory, so we have 128 kilobytes of uh, shared RAM between the two cores. Um, and on the ARM, we have 18K of uh, L1 program and data cache, and on the DSP, uh, 32 kilobytes. Uh, so this large on-chip memory, it, it means that you're going to have to have less accesses to uh, external memory, which is another power saving. Uh, second, we also support uh, mobile DDR on these, which means uh, it, it's a little more expensive, but uh, if power saving is, uh, is a concern, then this will uh, provide lower power. So this is the first uh, architecture that we have, the floating point DSP with an ARM uh, built in on a uh, SOC. So we have a 32-bit or 64-bit floating point processor on the C64 674X, um, as well as fixed point. And for both of those cores, the floating and fixed point, they're um, completely compatible with the previous C6000 devices. So there's a lot of peripherals, um, as you can see on the right, and we're going to go through uh, most of them. And so the first one would be the programmable real-time unit, the PRU subsystem. So the PRU, again, is a, is a new uh, subsystem. And it's basically two 32-bit RISC processors running at half the, the uh, CPU frequency. So they have their own, each PRU core has its own uh, instruction and data RAM. Um, and it can access any of the uh, chip level resources. So it can uh, modify register values and any of the peripherals on the chip as well as uh, settings for the DSP and ARM. So the reason that uh, we've included it on this device is that, um, that there's really three things. The first is that it allows customer differentiation. You can customize these PRUs to pretty much do uh, any, anything you want within the limitations um, that it has. So if, a, if someone wanted to make a custom peripheral or something, then they can use the PRU to implement. So the PRU second is good at uh, doing tasks that require manipulation of uh, memory. So if you wanted to create a custom data movement uh, scheme that maybe the DMA doesn't do natively, you can implement that in the PRU, and that's one of the, the strengths of it. And the third, it's called the programmable real-time unit. So it's very efficient at real-time tasks. So all of the instructions, there's no pipeline or anything. Everything 
takes place in one clock cycle. So uh, it's very deterministic, and you're going to be able to, for anything that requires real-time uh, handling, uh, the PRU is good for that. So this is a block diagram of the PRU subsystem. You can see there's the two PRU cores with each of their own individual instruction RAM. Um, they also have their own data RAM, but uh, this goes through a, a, a switch, so they can both access um, either one of the data RAMs. So you could either uh, you could either implement a separate uh, program on each of the cores running independently of each other, or you could implement uh, two different parts of the same algorithm on each of the core and have them uh, talk back and forth and sharing their, their data. On this device, there's also uh, each core has 32 uh, general purpose outputs and another 30 general purpose inputs, um, which can be used for, uh, for externally interfacing to other uh, devices. So some of the examples of what we've done with this is uh, for the first use case would be uh, adding different peripherals. Um, we've actually already provided uh, code for implementing additional bus interfaces such as UART. Um, in addition, we've got code that does other things for data movement such as adding reverb or rim correction for, for audio algorithms. Uh, for reducing system power, the PRU can uh, actually turn off the clocks to both the ARM and the DSP and run independently. Um, and this allows you to go into a really low power state where only the uh, PRU is running or maybe one of the peripherals. Uh, and then based on some system event or external event, it can wake up the ARM or the DSP um, to, to do some additional processing. And third, if you wanted to accelerate your system performance or just take uh, take some cycles away from the DSP and the ARM, you can implement things, parts of algorithms on the PRU. Um, so there are some limitations. Um, this is a very uh, simple architecture, very uh, few instructions. So there's no multiplies and there's no accumulate. So that kind of limits what you can do um, in terms of uh, like DSP processing. But um, for other things, if you wanted to, to take some of the processing away from the ARM of the DSP, it can be implemented on the PRU. So what TI is providing is, uh, so the UART interface, we're providing a Linux driver, which will be free and available. Um, for the, then we were also creating a uh, hardware uh, board, which would uh, allow you to give you the extra UART ports that you need. Um, for the CAN interface, that's not quite available yet, but it's going to be a reduced CAN, a reduced speed CAN, and that will be available uh, coming soon. And we also provide all the software needed. So uh, this is all done in assembly. Um, so we provide uh, a simulator, we provide a programming guide, um, and a lot of examples on how to do simple tasks, sort of building blocks. And if you put these together, then you could uh, use it to create your own uh, PRU code. Okay, so uh, next we'll be going through the peripherals found on the uh, 0138, and we'll start with uh, the new ones that may uh, you may not have seen before. The first one is the universal parallel port called the UPP. So this is a high-speed data parallel port, and there's two uh, bidirectional and independent 16-bit channels. Now when we say bidirectional, uh, it really means that they can be configured either to be an input channel or an output channel from the chip. Uh, but during actual operation, they, they would not be bidirectional, they're fixed. But either way, you can configure them to be uh, either direction. Um, it's a simple I.O. protocol with a dedicated internal DMA for the peripheral. And uh, there's three things that uh, we would say give this, give this UPP peripheral some value. And the first would be um, if you're going to talk to an external FPGA. So on previous devices, we've used other peripherals like uh, HPI or maybe even using the video port. To, uh, to kind of a convoluted way to talk to other devices. Um, the UPP allows a high-speed parallel interface, and so that would be good for talking to an FPGA. Uh, second would be if you had, say, two of these OMAP L138 devices in a multiprocessor system, you can as the slave and one configured as the master, and uh, have them talk to each other that way. And the third way is if you had uh, high-speed DACs and ADCs, uh, parallel DACs and ADCs, you can use the UPP um, to get a pretty high throughput. And so if you look on the right, we have a table um, that basically shows the different configurations and the throughput you can achieve with that. Um, 
So if you're using both channels going opposite directions, you get a throughput of about 240 megabytes per second. And this compares with HPI, which is a, a more common, uh, what we're using currently, which is about 50 megabytes per second. Uh, the OMAP L138 is the first device to have the serial ATA interface. And uh, the serial ATA, of course, is going to be used for uh, large storage applications, maybe uh, connecting an external hard drive. Um, on this device, we support uh, Gen 2, which is 3 gigabits per second. Um, some of the other features that the controller uh, supports would be the hot plugging, um, some of the uh, other power down modes, and we also support a port multiplier. So even though we only have one SATA uh, connection to our device, you can use an external port multiplier to get up to, I think, about 15 total SATA devices. Uh, next, uh, we have a MMCSD. So uh, I wanted to say first that I'm going to be going through all the peripherals uh, that are supported by the OMAP L138. Um, for the Hawk board, many of these are natively on the board. So, for example, that we do have a static connector and there's a uh, MMCSD slot in there. Um, but some of the other ones may not be directly on the board, and there's a header which has almost all the other signals going out to it. So if you had your own custom card or custom board, you could use uh, that connector to implement some of these other peripherals. So uh, MMC, we support uh, <clears throat> up to 26 megahertz, and... Uh, we maximum clock at 37.5 uh, for the SD card. So for EMFA, there's two uh, external memory interfaces on the 138. The first one we call EMFA, uh, and it has uh, two interfaces. It has a SD RAM interface, which gives you 512 megabytes of uh, addressable range with a 16-bit data bus. Um, and second, we have an async interface, which gives you 64 megabytes of address range with four chip selects. And the asynchronous memory would be used for, say, uh, booting from a NAND flash or a NOR flash, and we support both of these modes along with uh, error correction for the NAND flash. Uh, the other memory interface we have would be the DDR2 or MDDR controller. We go um, and support a maximum of 512 uh, memory for DDR2 and 256 megabytes for MDDR. Uh, so the rest of these will kind of go quickly through. I'm not going to read uh, all the details of these, but we have the slides provided if you want to go back and get more information on any of these. Uh, we have an Ethernet uh, EMAC controller on board, which supports a 10 base T as well as a 100 base T. Um, next, we have USB. So there's two USBs. The first one, uh, USB 2, is the on-the-go one. So this supports the uh, up to high-speed operation. And it also supports the on-the-go extension. So we have session requests and uh, host negotiation. Where host negotiation would be where if one device wants to switch roles and be the uh, device instead of the host, they can do that in real time and switch back and forth. Um, session requests would be when the host goes to sleep and turns off the V bus, uh, and then the, the device can wake that up remotely. We also have a USB 1.1, and this operates only in host mode, um, and uh, we support the low and full speed rates, so up to 12 megabits per second. Next, we have the LCD controller. Um, this is not on the Hawk board. Um, this is going to be on the extra uh, header we provide, and this is going to, uh, we have a maximum pixel clock of, I think, 37.5 megahertz. So what this means is I think you'll get a maximum resolution of around 800 by 600 at uh, 60 frames a second. Now, the, the actual controller supports up to 1024 by 1024 resolution. So if it's something that you don't need uh, to have a high refresh rate on, so that's going to be a lot lower than 60, um, it can still handle that. And there's two modes we support. The one would be the lid mode, which if you're going to be outputting to, say, a character display or something that has... Uh, frame buffer built into it, you could use the lid mode, um, and also the raster mode, which would be more for connecting to an LCD for uh, video or graphics. 